Hello and welcome to the Wolf SSL live webinar, Explosive, present by Wolf SSL Senior Engineer Jim. My name is Shizuka and I will be moderator, mo moderating this webinar. All attendees will be in listen-only mode. If you have a question, please use the Q&A box. We will host a Q&A session following the presentation. The webinar will also be recorded and made available on our YouTube channel shortly after the presentation. I invite you to follow us on Twitter at WolfSSL, as well as our other socials. Also, feel free to email us if you have any additional questions. And now I would like to give a brief company overview before we move to the technical presentation. Today, Wolf SSL secures over 2 billion connections. We have more than 1,000 OEM customers and that's in our resellers. Wolf SSL is made up of over 50 dedicated employees, most of which are engineers. This progress is of, of, of this progress of, is of course supported by a strong partner network that we proud of. Since the beginning, our engineering team has developed several embedded security products, including WolfCrypt Wolf with DO178 support, HEP certification, and a HEP's ready offering, MQT, MQTT up to the B5 sub specification, SSHB2, TPM 2.0, a secure boot loader known as a wolf boot, as well as the Java wrappers and a JSSE support and commercial support for Coral. All of these offerings are accompanied by through maintenance and support plans up to the 24 seven level. We also offer full service consulting. And now I would like to turn it over to Jim to talk about Espresso. Yeah, hi everybody, and uh, thanks so much for taking the time to hear my presentation today to, on uh, getting started with Wolf SSL on the ESP32. Now, about midway through, I'll, I'll pause the, my presentation is broken up into two parts, so kind of an initial environment setup, and then getting into more details on the ESP32. And so about midway, if you have any questions, we'll pause. And then of course, at the end, uh, we'll have additional uh, time for questions. And so go Jimmy Pie. Um, some of you I, I might have met at Hackaday. Uh, my name is Jim. I'm a part-time Wolf SSL contractor. I'm focused on the ESP32. Uh, my degree is in electronic engineering from Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo, California. 30 years of experience, software development, automation experience. Um, I'm on Twitter. You might have seen me at the, the gojimmypie.github.io. I have a blog there that I really, it's somewhat notes to self, but if you know, some of the details that are there might be helpful on a variety of different um, things, including the ESP32. So in order to prepare for this presentation, I, I went out to Espressif and I took a screen snip of one of the recent financial statements. So here's, um, you know, here's Espressif, right? It, it's bigger than a lot of people realize. Um, they have millions of devices in the fields. A lot of those devices that you see at Home Depot, the, the Wi-Fi light bulbs, right? There, there's an Espressif device inside there. So there are many different Espresso chips these days. Uh, the ones you see on the screen here, the ones with a dash C suffix, those are the newer RISC-V chipsets. Uh, the others are the, the Extensa architecture. Um, you know, I went out to Mouser and, and Mouser.com, you know, they, they sell elect electronic components and I wanted to see how inexpensively you can add an ESP32 to your project. And, and so here's one, the ESP32-C3, one of their RISC-V chipsets. And you can get one for a little more than a dollar. And if you see the, the size of the footprint here, five millimeters by five millimeters, that's in, in American terms, that's less than two tenths of an inch on a side for about a dollar and you get Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. So really, why wouldn't you use one of those in a project to add Wi-Fi capabilities to a device? So early on, one of the, one of the things that I was working on was um, I used this M5 stack device. It's called, it's called an M5 stick. I thought it was kind of fun to have a SSH on a stick. And, and what I did is I took another one of 
Wolf SSL's products is called Wolf SSH. And, and I have an example out there in Wolf SSH examples. And what this is, is there's an ESP32 in here. It's kind of cool from, from Espressif where they have uh, and enclosures for their devices, right? It's one thing to prototype something, but it's kind of nice to have an enclosure so you can actually use it in the field without worrying about stuff falling on the PC board and such. And so what I did here is I set it up so it's a Wi-Fi hotspot. You can connect to it from a computer over SSH, but it's connected to the UART port here. So if you guys have ever needed to connect to a router or something where you have to walk up your PC and connect it to the serial port and then walk to the next router. It's, here's kind of a fun little project where you can add Wi-Fi capabilities to a, U, a UART port and it's, it's secure, you get SSH, use SSH. And so today, uh, today my objective is to talk about what Wolf SSL is and why you'd want to use it with an ESP32 project. Um, give you some examples of how you can take Wolf SSL for a test drive. And, and most importantly, if, if you want to use Wolf SSL, like what if, what if you want to use it in a commercial project, right? So it's out there on, on GitHub, it's all GPL v2, it's free, you download it, you go do what you want with it, but it is GPL v2 licensed, but it's dual licensed. So it's, um, we'll talk about using Wolf SSL on a commercial project. And at the end, uh, there are lots of places where you can learn more. I have a a couple of links that will show you uh, where you can learn even more beyond today's presentation. And so let's roll our own encryption. Yeah, well, I added this slide at the last minute. This was from Hackaday just yesterday. Um, it, it's never a good idea to roll your own encryption. Uh, it never is a strong word, but, but in this case, I, I really believe it applies. I mean, you never want to roll your own encryption and it's it's, Really, these days, it's super appropriate to have everything open source so everybody can see what's going on. There's no back doors. You, everybody can look at it, try to break it. We find things, we fix them. Nothing's perfect, but it's it's pretty darn good. Uh, it's it's we tell everyone it's the best tested, and and I can tell you from experience uh, creating a PR, the 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 testing is it's pretty thorough. Um, and so. What is Wolf SSL? Wolf SSL essentially secures the internet. Um, here's some of the many different industries that uh, are using Wolf SSL products. Um, many different types of devices, communications in many different industries. So as we mentioned at the beginning, there, there are over a thousand OEM customers. I added this um, just to emphasize that I, um, billions of secure connections. Right. So this Wolf SSL has been around for quite a while. Um, they definitely know what they're doing. I, I did a little Google search. So if you say, well, so who else is using Wolf SSL? Well, I, I went out and I saw that uh, Amazon, they have this interesting post on, on AWS using post quantum algorithms with a Wolf SSL client. And so, yeah, there's there's been a lot of hype about quantum cryptography and the news and how it's gonna break. Uh, traditional security. And so Wolf SSL has for a while been working on post quantum. We have uh, partnerships in the industry. Uh, we got engineers dedicated to doing post quantum work on staff. Another one, Microsoft. So Microsoft has embraced Wolf SSL. Here it is on their documentation page on using Wolf SSL for TLS connections. Explains how to use that. And so one of our questions, what is Wolf SSL? Well, Wolf SSL, it's commercial grade encryption libraries and applications. Uh, you can use it on, on any device. Um, my focus has been on the, on the ESP32, on an embedded devices, but it can be used on anything that needs to have encryption capabilities. Um, the thing that really distinguishes Wolf SSL is the NIST certification, the DO-178 certif uh, certification. We talked about that. Um, at the very beginning, um, to use your device in a serious environment that needs a certification, um, most of the other providers don't provide these certifications. Um, it's open source. We I mentioned earlier, uh, you, you can go check it out. You can download it. You can see all the different platforms that it runs on. See for yourself uh, how it works. 
Um, Key is uh, consulting services, the 7 by 24 support. Uh, there's engineering services available to help you if you have an existing project uh, that might be a little bit more complex. Uh, we have engineering uh, services available to help integrate Wolf SSL or perhaps change from a different provider that's not NIST or not DO 178 certified. So the main areas of focus, uh, data at rest. Um, you know, if you're not familiar with that, that's that's a term used for, it's simply like a, a file that's saved on your hard drive, um, but you want to keep that file secure, so it would be encrypted. Data in transit is when you want to take that, what might otherwise be a plain text file, and you want to transmit it over the wire, over Ethernet, over Bluetooth, over a UR to someplace else, so that's data in transit. Uh, it's a little bit trickier because you usually want to do that relatively quickly, and so um, typically, something like uh, SSL, TLS, SSH protocols to use to transmit data um, to someplace else. And of course, in the embedded world, the, the firmware updates, you want to make sure that if you have a device that's gathering critical data, maybe from a piece of machinery providing feedback or something, that uh, the, the firmware that you put on there is the firmware that you want to be on there, and it hasn't been altered in any way. And so there's another product called Wolfboot. Um, that helps with uh, monitoring firmware updates. And of course, any data that you transmit over the wire, your binary needs to be secured with uh, something like SSL, TLS. So the thing I like about Wolf SSL, this is how I got started. I was, I was actually working on that SSH server before I started doing consulting work for Wolf SSL. It, it's out there, it's free, you take it for a test drive. And so anyone can use uh, Wolf SSL to prototype um, prototype your project and see how it works and um, see how well it works. Uh, the key here is, is once you have a prototype, you want something that scales and is perhaps going to be purchased by uh, the government. And if it's purchased by the government, it needs to be NIST certified. So uh, as everyone knows, uh, the security issues are becoming a bigger and bigger concern with more and more companies dependent on them. Um, so the government is getting, the US government is getting more serious and, and really other governments as well uh, about having really robust communication uh, in place. And the US government has this NIST certification, Wolf SSL has FIPS 140-2, a proud owner of certificate number 3389. And we're expecting uh, the 140-3 certification to be available uh, later this year. And it's, and it's the same code base. I mean, even if you don't have your specific device NIST certified, the, the FIPS ready code, it's the same code. It just hasn't been verified formally in a lab by NIST, but it's it's all the same code out on, out on GitHub. So at the beginning, we, we talked a little about the partner program uh, there's this is only a subset of all the different partners. Some of the other folks have uh, Wolf SSL baked into their own IDE, makes it really easy to get started uh, in in other uh, for other chipsets. Um, different platforms, different applications. I uh, let you browse through this list here. Um, hardware cryptography support uh, we do on many different devices. Espresso, of course, has hardware acceleration. So Wolf SSL products. Wolf SSL has a variety of products. You'll see across the bottom here, there's a Java provider, there's a C Sharp wrapper, there's a Python wrapper. So if you have different applications in different environments, Wolf SSL can be used in many different places. We, we talked about Wolf Boot a little bit there, like ensuring that you get the firmware on the device that you want to be on the device securely. Um, Wolf SSH I touched on a little bit, that little, that UART project. There's Wolf MQTT. I've used that. It's, it's actually a pretty handy little mechanism to transfer small amounts of data, maybe like a, some sort of sensors and such. Um, but today, the, it's a getting started webinar, and we're going to be talking about the Wolf SSL and, and WolfCrypt, the core of, um, of Wolf SSL and, and the other products. So we talked about licensing. It's dual licensed. It's a open source out on GitHub, GPL v2. All the source code is there and available to download and, and run immediately. And of course, there's a commercial license available 
7 by 24 support. Um, you don't ha have to comply with the GPL v2 license. If you buy the commercial license, you can have a proprietary product that uses Wolf SSL internally, and nobody even needs to know. Actually, many of our products, uh, many of our customers, they, you know, they, they don't tell people whose provider they're using internally. It, it's, uh, it's part of their trade secret. And so, as I mentioned, uh, the core is, is Wolf SSL and WolfCrypt. Um, as we get started the, with the ESP32, we'll see how these names actually end up in, in specific directories. So Wolf SSL is, is the transport mechanism. It, it's a little misleading because, yeah, it's the name of the company, but it's also the name of the repository. And so there's Wolf SSL is the, it's, it's like the, the TLS, the transport layer that's moving data around. And then WolfCrypt, WolfCrypt is, is the suite of um, algorithms, if you will, that are used by this layer. And so we'll go into a little bit more detail on that. Um, I mentioned on how the, how the names fall into place for, um, for a given project. And so here's, here's something I created at the last minute. It's, uh, um, this is an example project. It's a, it's a bare bones, what it takes to use Wolf SSL in a project that doesn't really do anything other than it, it prints a hello world kind of uh, line from Espresso and it prints a hello world thing from Wolf SSL, but it's, it's an example, it's a bare bones example to allow you to start from scratch rather than the other more elaborate examples that you'd have to, if you want to use it for your own project, you'd have to peel out all the stuff that you don't want. And so this project, uh, it's called Template. And Wolf SSL gets installed as a component for Wolf SSL. And don't be too intimidated here. I got a really clever way to that makes this super easy. I'm just telling you a little bit of the background here. And so Wolf SSL is a component inside your project. And the key will be this, this include directory that'll have um, your user settings. And so you'll see that here's my project. It's called Wolf SSL template. There's just one component. It's Wolf SSL. And it's a component similar but different from all the components that come with the ESPIDF. And the ESPIDF, it's a development environment. We'll get into a little bit more detail on that coming right up here as well. So uh, again, so what is Wolf SSL? It's, a, it's a, a library. It's lightweight, portable. It's all written in C. There's no C++. Uh, it has a relatively small footprint for embedded devices. Um, you see all the different platforms that we support down here. I have free RTOS highlighted as free RTOS. If you've done any SPIDF programming with Espresso, that's what uh, what's used there. And so you'll see that after you get started with today's webinar, it's it actually is very easy to get started. And so a little beyond the scope of today's webinar is is the TLS client and server example. So you can go out to GitHub um, in the ESPIDF directory, in the examples directory, there's a Wolf SSL client and a Wolf SSL server. And so you could add, those are examples of how to get devices or, or even just different applications talking to each other securely with Wolf SSL. So we talked a little bit about WolfCrypt, uh, but, right? So Wolf SSL is the main encryption library, it's the component that we'll call it in uh, on the Espresso environment. And so underneath Wolf SSL is Wolf Crypt. And so for, you know, we talked about all the different algorithms that are used by Wolf SSL to secure data and communications. And so how do you get started? I mean, that's why everybody's here, right? Um, just about any computer, the ESPIDF runs on Mac, Linux, Windows. I, I use a Windows WSL, the Windows subsystem for Linux combo. I do some things in Windows, but I really like Linux, so I do some things with WSL. You can use any editor. So it's just a programming language. You write C code, so whatever editor or environment you want. Um, the key is using the Espresso ESPIDF environment. Um, when you're using Wolf SSL, you might need a different tool chain if you also want maybe a desktop app or some uh, command line app to talk to your Espresso ESP32 device. I did a quick Google search for text editors. There's a lot of text editors. I'd never even heard of some of these. 
Um, the ESPIDF, if you've never used it, um, just Google Espresso Getting Started. This is an excellent guide, very well written, um, that explains what it takes to get the programming environment installed. It's, uh, it's super easy to use. You run an executable, it sets everything up, and you're ready to go. So to go out there and read this documentation, it's uh, very self-explanatory. Me, I actually use, I'm a, I've been programming in Visual Studio, like basically the whole time Visual Studio has been around. Um, I remember getting Visual Studio on a, on a floppy disk as a prototype at a software company that I'd worked on with. Um, today, Visual Studio is, it's awesome. It's unbelievably awesome for me, I, I think, but I, I respect that there's a lot of other people that use different environments. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking a little bit about Visual Studio, and I use this, uh, this add-in, this extension called Visual GDB. It takes all the power of Visual Studio and allows you to do embedded debugging, single step, breakpoints, all the things that you can do with Visual Studio on a normal application, but with an embedded device. Visual GDB installs a little bit differently. It, it's the same install, but it, it's in a different directory than if you use the ESP IDF uh, install from Espresso. Um, specifically, it installs to the sys GCC directory, um, in this case for the ESP32, installing the ESP IDF. And so inside the ESP IDF, I have three different um, versions available. There's 5.0, 5.1 was released fairly recently. And you can just go to a prompt and, and I get I did a git clone and, and I called uh, the ESP IDF master. And so if I can go to a command prompt and just do a git fetch and a git pull, and I have the, the very latest code for the IDF in um, from the master branch of the ESP IDF. One little quick note, um, it's not formally supported, right? So the folks that make Visual GDB, they want you to use Visual GDB in Visual Studio. I, I choose to stretch that a little bit. I actually use it from the command prompt because it is the exact same thing. Um, but the one catch, the only catch I think that you'll, you might run into is, yeah, if anybody's ever used Linux and Windows, we got the, the line endings. Uh, there's a dust Unix command. You might need to convert a couple of the the commands that strip out the Windows carriage returns, they only have line feeds. And then once you do, uh, if you've ever used the ESP IDF before, you might recognize the export command and then it proceeds as usual. So this is the only little catch if you're gonna use the Visual GDB ESP IDF in WSL. Uh, one of the things that I like about Visual GDB is this, this it's visual. Uh, there's, here's the, the Visual GDB project properties. Um, in this case, I'm, I'm working on this, the Wolf SSL client in the IDF version five for an ESP32 debug mode. You pick your tool chain. Uh, remember we talked about which ESP IDF version. So here I'm using version 5.1. There's just a drop down here. You can change to 5.0, the master branch. Pick which device you wanna target. There's a drop down here for which COM port you wanna use. Oh, here's my favorite, this, this filter box, right? So if you've ever used the ESP IDF, you, you know there are many, many configuration settings. So you can come down here and you can just type in stack or heap to filter for the configurations. And you, it'll, it'll filter the, um, these items here to just the items matching that search text. So um, in order to get debugging, single step debugging breakpoints working on um, in Visual Studio, uh, you would, or really anything, there are other environments, right? I'm, I, we can use VS Code. Some people even, there's all sorts of ways to use JTAG debugging. Um, and my favorite board is, is Joe's uh, TyGuard board. It's all open source. We all love open source. It's out at um, TyGuard tools forward slash TyGuard. Um, it's for sale at one bit square, a one bit squared. Um, and so for all you guys that are attending today, if you, uh, if you'd like a discount coupon code, you can contact me on social media, right? I'm go Jimmy pie on Twitter, or you can send me an email at Jim at Wolf SSL. And I have a coupon code for you. If you want to have a little bit of a discount on, on the tie guard board, uh, it's more than just 
a JTAG for, I use this JTAG for the ESP32. See, there's a couple of other connectors. It actually, it's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty impressive board. But it's a lot to see here, right? So it's, it's, you'd like it. Um, so the ESP32, if you have a JTAG board and you want to connect it to your ESP32, uh, it's a, the hard part is figuring out which pins, right? Which of the pins on your JTAG go to which pins on your ESP32. Uh, so this is information that's critical to getting uh, debugging working properly. Um, the other thing about a JTAG is it, it also flashes memory way faster and way more efficiently than through the UART. And, and if you've ever used an ESP32, you know, there's those little buttons. Uh, yeah, this, it just puts the, uh, puts the binary directly on the chip. Um, you'll notice that I, I don't have the power connected here. So just the ground and these JTAG signals are what I recommend. So once you have your JTAG connected in Visual Studio, there's a debug settings. Uh, again, on the, the project properties page, just right click on your project and it brings up this project properties. We'll debug using OpenOCD. So you, you have to dig down a little bit. There, there's a ton of different uh, JTAG programmers supported. So you go down into the interface, FTDDI, and there's a, a tigar.cfg file that you'll need to select. Pick a frequency if you want. Um, you saw back on the ES, ESP IDF project page, there was you pick a device that you want to debug. We're debugging an ESP32 here. You press the test button here, and it runs through a JTAG test, make sure that it can actually communicate with the device. You see the settings tested successfully. That means you're going to be able to step into, set breakpoints, all those interesting things. And so here's um, here's my tie guard uh, set up with uh, really a, an awesome board that I scored at Hackaday last year. Um, it's It's got all these pins broken out and labeled. It's a really big board. It was one of the FAO boards for the for last year's uh, badge. Um, I did need to spend a bit of time. It's a little bit more challenging than I would have thought to connect all these little wires. You see one in the background there, and I, I broke them out into headers here to get the JTAG. So even though there's all these pins everywhere, um, the JTAG wasn't broken out. So I had to add that. Um, if you use something like this one, I bought this board from Amazon, right? It's an, you can see here it's an ESP32 dev kit. Um, these pins are a little bit easier to connect your, uh, your tie guard to. So this is another example, uh, ESP32 board. Um, really, my, my absolute favorite board is the ULX3S. It, it's an FPGA board. Uh, it's been around for a few years. There, it's going to be in stock soon at Mouser. Um, and before you start wondering, it's like, well, hey, that's an FPGA. What did that have to do with today's talk? Oh, there's an ESP32 on the back. So you got this board that's got an ESP32 and an FPGA. So if you ever wanted to experiment with all these different peripherals and an FPGA and a bunch of memory, and you got Wi-Fi, you got Bluetooth all on one board, um, go check this out. It's at ulx3s.github. Io. And so, yeah, so we talked about uh, setting up the ESP IDF. We talked about a couple of different boards to use. We talked about the, the JTAG. Um, typically what I do when I get going, I, I set up an environment variable. Um, and in this case, it's pointing to the ESP IDF version 5.1. Uh, you'll see the instructions. They tell you, you type a dot, the path, or you can just CD in the, this directory. Um, and, you, and you run export, right? Really, the bottom line is you run export. And once you get this prompt done, you can now compile ESP IDF projects. You're ready to go. And so that's, that's the first part of our webinar. I, I think I'll pause here in case anybody has any questions. Um, we only, we're about halfway. And so um, I'll pause and see if anybody has any questions so far. And then we'll have a, another at the end. We can answer some more questions at the end. Yes, I do have other questions. So this person wants to know if NISD third is HIPS one hundred and forty. Huh? Is is it? What was the first word before the one hundred and forty? It was a uh, NISD certificate. Is right. HIPS one hundred and forty? 
So, um, so the 140 dash two is the current FIPS certification of Wolf FFL. Um, I'm not sure if that answers the question. And, and then there's, uh, there's another, there's an updated certificate uh, that we're expecting later this year, the 140 dash three. Um, I hope I'm answering that question. Uh, feel free to clarify your question if I didn't. And, and I do have another question. What is the best way to test the Wolf SSL working? Oh yeah, uh, stay tuned for the second half. I, I have I have a, the exact answer for that. If uh, I have the perfect answer, stay tuned. Second half. Okay. Um, and I do have another question. Would be uh, I never use an open source encrypt encryption library. How can it how can it be secure if all this secure code is available? Oh yeah, yeah. That um, that's an excellent question. So um, so the source code it. it it's all about the algorithms. Uh, the way that you you keep it secure is uh, there's a there's a key, and so maybe you've seen on media where somebody has lost their key, so hackers got in, and so keeping your device secure is all about making sure that the key that you use is not disclosed. So everybody understands how the encryption works. That's why it can be open source, but the key, no, no pun intended, well, kind of pun, uh, is, is to make sure that your key can um, cannot be stolen. I hope that answers that question. Anything else? I don't have any questions at the moment. Yes. All right. All right, cool. So we uh, we will continue. This is where uh, this is where we actually start using uh, Wolf FFL in the ESP IDF. And so to use Wolf FFL on the ESP32, um, I found that there's there's basically three different ways, uh, each with the pros and cons of how to use Wolf FFL. And and the first is the ESP component registry. It is by far the single most easy way to, to get started. It's uh, Espresso has done an amazing job to give, to, to bake into their development environment, the ability to download a component and install it with little or, or no effort. Um, the catch there is, is it's a, it's a fixed version in time. It's, uh, it, it's local to your project. Uh, you you can't easily go to GitHub and and fetch the latest, right? So they have pros and cons. Um, similar to the next one I have here, just installing locally. So if uh, the other method, a bit more complex, you you need to download Wolf FFL um, either from the website. You, know, you get a release version in a zip file, or you go out to GitHub and you you do a Git clone, and and basically you install Wolf FFL. You copy all of the source code. Um, into your project, into a components Wolf SSL directory. There's a script that helps you do that. Um, it's a little bit more challenging than the ESP component registry. I, it has the benefit, similar benefit, where all of the code is, is in your project. It's, it's a little bit difficult to contribute upstream. So like, say, for instance, you forked Wolf SSL into your own repository and then Maybe you want to add some print statements so you can do some debugging, but maybe you want to save that back. The it, it's not part of the Wolf SSL repository, of course, when it when it's copied. Um, so my preference, this third option here, is I have a CMake file, and all you need to do is you need to drop that in the Wolf SSL directory, and it just knows what to do. It knows how to go look for the Wolf SSL source code. Um, it allows you to use shared code if you want, or you could potentially have different repositories for different projects. Um, but the source code isn't directly in your project. You you use it to point to where Wolf SSL is. And, and I suppose if even if you wanted it in your project, you could just point to your project. Um, that's also with the, the Visual Studio, the Visual GDB projects that I use. All of all of those use the CMake file, and, and so these three options we'll talk about in a bit more detail. 
So the first one, the easiest one to get started is go to components.espresso.com. And you'll see there's a search box there and you just type in Wolf FFL. So you'll see once you go to Wolf FFL, there's a command down here. All you need to do is uh, click this little button here to copy it to your clipboard. And that's the only command you need. If you have an existing ESP IDF project and you want to add the Wolf FFL component, you just run this command, add dependency, boom, you're there. So this is uh, this is a relatively new feature. So I want to point out just some anomalies that might be a little bit eyebrow raising. Um, it says pre-release. I, I need to spend some time. I need to talk to the guys and figure out um, at Espresso how I can remove the pre-release. It, it actually is the 5.6 stable version. So even though it says pre-release, it, it's the release. It's the 5.6 release. Um, the other thing that I, I didn't quite figure out yet is it says that it's GPL2 only. So even though it says it's GPL2 only, it's dual licensed, just like on the GitHub repository for Wolf SSL, um, GPL version two and commercial. Uh, be sure to scroll down. There's, there's a lot more information there on getting started, a bunch of documentation. Um, the other thing you saw on that page Right, so a little farther down here, there's examples. And so I have two examples there. One's the Wolf SSL benchmark and Wolf SSL test. So one of the questions were like, how do you know Wolf SSL is working? Well, these two, uh, these two apps will show if Wolf SSL, like all the code is working, it runs through a bunch of tests. Uh, Wolf SSL benchmark, how fast is it? Um, similar to adding Wolf SSL to an existing project, you can, these will create an entire project. You just copy this, you click this button here, it'll copy this command. So it looks kind of long, but right? So it's idf.py, we all know that one. And the command is create project from example. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. Wolf SSL is our, uh, our, um, our namespace. Um, Wolf SSL is the component. And then you'll see at the end here is uh, the version that you want to use. The colon here says, okay, so where do you want to put this? So we're going to put this into the Wolf SSL underscore benchmark app. So with one command, create an app. You can create this Wolf SSL benchmark app um, on your local computer and run it. And so I actually have a demo here. It's about from zero to Wolf SSL benchmark in about three minutes. Um, so I'll just start this video here. I had pre-recorded this. And so I'm, I'm in, in Ubuntu WSL on my local home drive there. I'll make a demo directory, change into that directory. So we're in an empty directory. So we talked about running the export command to get the ESPIDF set up. So we're ready, ready to build here. So here's the command we copied from the Espresso component directory. It created a directory called Wolf SSL Benchmark. So we change into Wolf SSL Benchmark there. Oops, sorry, I skipped back to the beginning. Sorry about that. Um, oh, having a little mishap here, a little mishap. That was kind of the most important. Here we go. Sorry, with the little mouse there. And so we just build, right? So we'll, we're actually going to pause it here since I had the little mishap. So we changed into the Wolf SSL Benchmark directory. And we just ran the idf.py command, right? So we're going to flash. Flash knows that if there's not a binary that we're going to build as well. My serial port is on COM30, which turns out to be in WSL. Um, the port is dev TTY S37 is, is COM37. I'm setting a baud rate of 115-200. Um, I like doing this. Um, I, I found that some of the higher speeds, I don't know if it's my environment, my USB cables, but I found that sometimes higher speeds can be problematic. So I always like to start out at a lower speed. And then this last one, this monitor, this will immediately, once the uh, binary has been um, uploaded to the device, it'll, it'll jump in to the UART monitor. And so we'll continue going here. It's compiling, I think we're going, right? Uh, yeah. Compiling here. So you see it found Wolf SSL.
A lot of that was my CMake file that shows some diagnostic information. Here we're building um, the ESPIDF, all, basically all of the components that are in the ESPIDF get installed. And so here's, right, here's all those getting compiled. So we're about a minute and a half into my three minute video to get Wolf SSL running from scratch. Approaching the finish line here. Now we're compiling Wolf SSL. So it's Wolf SSL is the namespace underscore underscore Wolf SSL. And that's just because it's the ESPIDF component is, is that naming convention there. So we're done with that. We we have our binary, the Wolf SSL benchmark dot bin. So we got the bootloader there. Connecting to the serial port. Here's the bootloader getting loaded. Here, we're, here we are uploading our application. Again, this is the Wolf SSL benchmark app. So as soon as it's done, it'll immediately connect to the monitor. There's the ESP32 app running and, and here's the Wolf SSL benchmark. And so it'll go through and, and depending on what features are enabled, the, the benchmark will show different results. So if you turn different SHAs on or off, um, this list may be different, but this is, uh, this is the configuration that I currently have. That's it. And so at the end, I, there's a little stack high water mark that I show like how much was used. And so that's what it took to get Wolf SSL from nothing, just running um, in an example app. And you can change into that directory, look at the source code, see how that, that all works. Uh, let's see here. So the next one, so the first one we talked about, of course, was using the component registry. Uh, you saw that three minutes, boom, 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 it's ready to go. This next one's a little bit more involved, um, but also a little bit more flexible. So this is where you go out and you get clone Wolf SSL, or you can go to wolfsl.com and download a zip file. Um, so recall previously, we talked about the, the names, right? So Wolf SSL is the name of the company, but in the Wolf SSL repository, there's a Wolf SSL directory, and a wolf crypt directory. The wolf SSL directory is the one that has all of the header files. Uh, wolf SSL, uh, there, you'll see there's a wolf crypt that has all the wolf crypt files. Um, if it turns out you have a project that's already using OpenSSL, you don't want to recode your OpenSSL and you want to use wolf SSL, there's an OpenSSL wrapper. Um, we do not recommend starting with OpenSSL if you want to use wolf SSL, uh, right? Just use wolf SSL directly. Um, in the WolfCrypt directory, there these are the two uh, samples that we talked about earlier, the test and the benchmark. Uh, these are the same test and benchmark apps that are used by Linux apps by different platforms. Um, and then all the source code to WolfCrypt is found in this, this source directory here. So again, continuing on the, the option number two of installing uh, Wolf SSL locally. Once you have a copy of the Wolf SSL library inside the IDE, Espressif, ESP IDF directory, there's a couple of setup commands. And basically there's, uh, there's a readme there and it'll explain how to, uh, to run these setup commands and copy Wolf SSL to your project. So if you're using, um, if you're gonna use Wolf SSL, it, you'll almost certainly want some sort of additional app that's not running on the ESP32 that you may want to communicate with your ESP32. And so in the root of the WolfSSL repository, there's an install document. So once you have a WolfSSL, you need to run autogen once. Um, then later, it's all about configure. Um, this is deceptively simple with just the configure shown here, but there are many options that you can add to turn on and off features. You do a make, make check. Um, you can optionally install it if you want. Um, 
in, if, if it's on, in a Linux environment, you want to have just the WolfSSL library available. Um, we're also going to talk today a little bit about the Cypher suite. So we I, previously in, in this slide, we were talking about installing, uh, mentioned the configure command to enable and disable features. I thought one of the really cool features to show is uh, the, the Shang Mi, the SM Cypher suites. We just recently added um, Cypher support, and this is this will be uh, super important if you ever wanted to do business um, in China or with Chinese companies, they uh, use the Cypher suite um, a lot. Uh, you can find the, the Cypher suite at, you go to github.com and wolfssl, there's another repository called wolfsm. Uh, all you need to do is once you have it cloned, right? So I usually work in my workspace, uh, mnt-c because I'm a WSL user. Um, you get clone the WolfSM repository, you change into WolfSM and you just install it. And the install is it's simply copy source file into a destination. And so, yeah, again, reminder down here, if you're doing business in China, or if you think that you have a product that you might eventually want to do business in China, consider whether you, your uh, provider has um, the SM Cypher suite available. And so here's a little bit more elaborate example of the configure command, right? So we, we run autogen, you run the configure command, and it's all about these dash dash enables. So here we're enabling SM3, the SM4 dash GCM. So you turn all these features on. So we do a make clean and a make. And, and so one of the examples that gets automatically built with the make in the root of the Wolf SSL repository, there's an examples directory. Uh, there's both a, a server and a client. In this case, we're looking at the client. And here's the, the client executable that just got built. Dash H for host. We're talking to our local host. Uh, which Cypher suite do you want? Notice we're doing the SM3 Cypher suite here. Dash C for certificate, the client certificate. Uh, notice there's a there's a, a search directory here that has some sample SM2 certificates. Um, dash K for key. We talked about protecting your key. You probably don't, you definitely don't want to have your private key out on GitHub. These are sample certificates, so everything's in the same place. Um, but this is the key file. This is the thing that you would, it's even named priv. You want to keep this key as secure as possible. This is your private key. And then dash A for the, the root authority. And so there's a sample root authority key file. So TLS 1.3. So um, the SM ciphers, I think there are two, yeah, there's two ciphers that work with TLS 1.3. Um, there are three more that work with TLS 1.2, and then uh, WolfSSL has a bunch of TLS 1.3 Cypher suites that are available. Um, it's better, it's faster, takes up less space. So if, um, if you can support TLS 1.3, I definitely recommend it. So option number three, we're talking about the, the make file here. Um, so there's a, a cmakelist.txt. It gets dropped into the WolfSSL directory. So in the components WolfSSL directory of our sample WolfSSL benchmark here, um, you'll see that we're in the Espresso ESPIDF example directory. So it, it's already there, but if you create a new project, be, be aware that that's where the WolfSSL CMake list lives. Um, in your project, in the root of your project, in this case here, this is this project is WolfSSL benchmark. There's another CMake list file. Um, to set where WolfSSL lives, you just set this CMake variable WolfSSL root to whatever path where your um, WolfSSL is installed. If you use this example, we went back here, <clears throat> excuse me, um, it knows that this project has WolfSSL a few directories up. And so, yeah, so here's the WolfSSL root. When using the Visual GDB projects, I have a Visual GDB directory, and there are projects, Visual Studio projects, in this case, all ready to go for the IDF version five, ESP32 S3. 
you just double click on this file, open it up, and it, it launches Visual Studio with the Visual GDB extension, and it, it's just ready to go. So WolfSSL is installed now. What? Well, we talked a little bit about the command line, the forward slash configure dash dash help will give you all of the options there. Um, for the embedded, it's a little bit more challenging. There's a user settings file. I mentioned that earlier. Um, so the user settings.h is typically manually handled. Uh, you can experiment with some of the features with command line apps. Um, but for the ESP32, all those settings are in uh, are saved in this user settings.h file. The good thing is we have sample files to get you started. So the all of the examples out there are pre-configured and ready to go. And then it's just a matter of fine tuning. You want to use less memory. You want to make it faster. You want to turn on some Cypher suites. You want to turn off some Cypher suites. But all of the settings, the only place you want to edit is the user settings.h. And you'll see that there are other configuration files. Don't touch them. All of the user settings for a project are in user settings.h. Uh, we talked about where that is. So you have a project or project here. And in the components, both SSL directory, there's an include directory. And so you just have this user settings.h. Um, this is the same for the previous, the, the, the uh, component and the, the copy, right? So the Wolf SSL has an include directory and that's where your user settings goes. It's all about the user settings. It's all the switches and dials and knobs to fine tune, uh, fine -tune your project. Um, and as an embedded developer, you probably know that yeah, you don't have a huge amount of memory. You don't have a huge amount of processing power. And so depending on exactly what you want to do, the user settings is where you make all the adjustments. So where do you learn more documentation? I, I know it takes away some of the fun. Um, but if you go to wolfssl.com in docs, there's a wolfssl manual. And in the wolfssl manual, in chapter two, building wolfssl, um, this is a very long page with all of the different options of turning things on and off, both the dash dash command line options, as well as the configure, uh, the configuration that you would put in your user settings.h, you know, the, the hashtag define uh, macros. So an example code. So WolfSSL out on GitHub in the WolfSSL repository, IDE Espressif. ESPIDF in the examples directory, there are you know, three key things, three key examples. Um, does it work? So there's a Wolf SSL test. You can run the Wolf SSL test. This is one of the ESP uh, registry component examples. Once you're confirmed that yes, Wolf SSL is working properly, how fast is it? So there's an example called Wolf SSL benchmark. And so beyond that, you're probably going to want some sort of communication. I and mean, that's what's cool about the ESP32 is the, the whole Wi-Fi capability. And so the practical examples are the, are the client and server TLS exchange examples. Um, typically, I will set up uh, an ESP32 server, and then I'll use a Linux command line app as a client. If you set up your server, uh, keep in mind your local firewall rules may or may not um, block incoming traffic. Uh, the default port, by the way, it's uh, you'll see in, in the source code, it's one 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 five one is the default port. So you'd need to open that port on, on your local firewall. Um, another heads up here, at least for the tie guard, probably for other uh, JTAG boards as well. Um, Windows, if anybody's used Windows, you know the problem with drivers. Windows wants to say, is, oh, that's an FTDI board. Yeah, but we don't want FTDI. You'll want to set the libUSBK drivers uh, to get JTAG debugging working with Visual Studio. Um, so I have an example here. Um, I, I can talk through more of this. We we ran a, I don't know if we can run over the hour, but I wanna give people a chance to ask any questions and then I can point out some of the cool things about Visual uh, GDB here. So I think I'll stop just a little early and see if there are any questions. I do have a question. Is what's the most common problems you've encount encountered with Wolf SSL on the ESP32? Oh yeah. So well 
the single most problem, and I, and I mentioned this early on, on, on programming the device, um, typically the, the problem that I have most isn't even with Wolf SSL, it's just getting code onto the ESP32. A lot of people, a lot of the boards, the third party boards mislabel the buttons or they don't implement the buttons properly. Um, the genuine espresso boards work really quite well, um, but the just getting code onto the ESP32, um, I found is typically the most problematic, believe it or not. Um, and beyond that, the thing to be aware of is stack size. Um, the stack size is um, in FreeRTOS, it's, uh, it's a very, uh, it's a small environment on the ESP32. Um, so, and the default stack size is relatively small. So those are the two things um, that I would keep in mind. Um, and if you ever have problems on your JTAG debugger, oh, here, here's another one. Um, if you get your ESP32 into this loop, like say there's like, as soon as it starts, it gets into this panic and it's rebooting. I've actually seen my JTAG device not be able to connect to a device that's in this continual reboot mode. And so when you see that, um, use the command line, it, even if it's slower to flash, just flash something simple like hello world uh, onto the ESP32 and that'll help your JTAG um, work a little bit better. Any other questions? I can talk through this example here that's kind of interesting. Yeah, do I, do, do I, do, we, I do have another question. Is there any minimum size of project to license Wolf SSL? Oh, uh, that's that's an excellent question. Um, no, there's there's no minimum size. I, I mean, yes, Wolf SSL is targeted towards a large commercial, industrial, government um, customers, um, but we welcome everybody. So if you have a small project, um, we would like to invest in you because you'll probably scale your project bigger and, and eventually have something larger. So don't be shy. Um, contact us at licensing at wolfsfl.com. Uh, no matter how small your project is, um, I'm sure we can work something out for you to license WolfSSL. Um, or, you, of course, you can just use it for free um, as long as you adhere to the GPL v2 um, license. But if you want to do something private, we can work with you on that as well. I do have another question. Uh, visual GDB, uh, GDB, I tested it several years back. What is maturity level? Meaning does it get in the way at all or only act as an enabler? Oh, um, you know, I used visual GDB as well years ago and I, I tried my darndest to get it to work. I really insisted that I would be able to get it to work with the ESP8266 and it it never really did. And the ESP8266, it, it was an early version. It, it had some issues. Um, if you haven't used Visual GDB in the last few years, it is vastly better. It, it's wonderful. I use it every day. It's very robust. Um, I, I use, um, I can't speak to other JTAG boards. I use the, the, the TIGARD. Um, but it's it's very robust and works extremely well with the ESP32. Uh, does that answer the question? And, and if not, feel free to clarify. And I do have another question. ESP32 shows up in different arches. Dash S, aka extensor, and dash C, aka risk dash B. I dash dash is Wolf SSL totally arch independent. Uh, the issue with crypto oscillation. What about different risk dash B model with or without relevant extensions? I hope you understand. Um, yeah, that's that's an interesting question um, that has several parts to it. Um, it might be best if if you actually sent me an email, but I'll try to do my best here. The, the classic ESP32 um, is extensive architecture. The dash S2 and the S3, those are both um, also uh, extensive architectures, although they're they're newer, a little bit different. Um, they've there were some some hardware issues, so kind of you know somewhat obscure, but there, there were some improvements that were made between the classic ESP32 and, and the Dash S version. They have slightly 
different architectures. The, there, there's some new hardware acceleration features with the Dash F chips. Um, the Dash Cs, those are the Risk Five chips. Um, and and I'm sorry, you you mentioned something that, about a Dash V, as in Victor. I'm not really sure I, I understand that. So if there's um, if there's a, a kind of a clarification on that, or um, I, I'd appreciate that. Sorry, I didn't really understand the full question. And and feel free to to send me an email and and we can or post something on the support forum so that everybody can see the uh, see the answer. Sorry if I don't have a better answer for that one. I do have another question. So say some ESP devices don't have a lot of memories. Do you mention a practical minimum to get useful work done? That's pretty subjective. Useful work, I, I, I think the answer is it, it depends. Um, you know, I'm gonna skip ahead just one slide here because it, it's kind of a teaser. Um, on the ESP32 S3, there's more PSRAM available. And with the thanks of this guy, Rudy, on Twitter, he was able to help me get Linux. You heard that right. Got Linux running on the ESP32 S3. And so, again, it, it depends, right? And, and early on, I'm not going to try to find that, that exact slide, but you saw that you can buy an ESP32, just, just the chip itself. So depending on your project, and we've had several customers that they, they designed their own board. So you can put however much PS RAM that you want. And so to ask to, to do something useful, I, it, it depends, right? So the examples that we, that we have out there, if, if you're gonna write something that just has a sensor and you're gonna read a temperature and you're gonna send it over, over MQTT, the smallest ESP32 that I've ever used um, works with Wolf SSL and can, you can grab a temperature, send it over MQTT. Um, but it, yeah, it depends on, on what your requirements are, it depends on the project. But the short answer is Wolf SSL will run on the smallest possible ESP32 that's out there. It, it just depends. We talked about all the switches and dials. It depends on what features you turn on and off and what you're trying to do. Um, please feel free to expand on the question if I, if I didn't answer it um, sufficiently. I do have another question. Uh, does Wolf SSL support the use of the microchip ATECC608 secure elements which stores the private keys and generates the TLS session key with the ESP32? That's, that's an excellent question. Um, yes, uh, we do support it. Uh, no, I haven't actually used it myself. So I've been, um, I, I can't answer any more than that. Um, we do support it. There is code for it. Um, I've not personally used it myself. But that's a great question. We um, Earlier, we had talked about um, protecting your keys. And yeah, so if you don't know what the ECC 508, the, the ECC 608, um, that's, a, that's a separate chip from a company called Microchip. And you can essentially store your keys in a, in a special place, if you will, um, that's uh, considerably more hardened, right? So if you just have an ESP32 and you have your key on the chip, somebody can come by and read all the memory and ta-da, there's your key, right? So physical security, obviously very important. Um, and so the ECC chips, the 508 and the 608, they add some um, physical security. There's some anti-tampering features. Um, nothing's perfect, uh, but it is, uh, that, that's a great question. And that is something, um, if you have a commercial product that would like to use that, I, I've actually been looking for an excuse to start taking that for a test drive. So I'd, I'd love to help you with that. I don't have any question at the moment. Okay, can can we run yeah. long? Because uh, I actually have a few more slides if people are interested. Actually, uh, there's a person who is raising the hand. So I okay. will unmute the person.
Hello. Connected here. Is am I audible? Oh, hey, yes. Hello. How can I help you? Hi, this is Surendra Bandari from India, South Asia. Oh, it's it's early in the morning for you. Thank you so much for joining. I, I know some people in your part of the world. Um, no, it's okay. I'm fine. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, my question is like uh, the uh, you know basic version of it uh, is absolutely free right now, or how it will be like how we charge like for our customer. Our customer are from uh, like uh, uh, you know uh, government and non-government both. And uh, moreover, like, uh, is this work on all like PKI, non PKI? Uh, you, you know, I, I don't know if it's my audio. I, I had a little bit of a difficult time um, hearing you. Um, just give me a quick sec. Let me turn up my audio. Oh. Sorry about that. I, I apologize. Um, could you ask your question again, please? Okay. Uh, I'm audible now. Uh, yes, I hear you. Okay, my question is like we work with government uh, departments as well and the private as well. Okay, and uh, uh, like uh, the basic version of the SSL is free, like uh, other SSLs, or uh, like uh, what is the charge for this? Uh, and second question is like uh, it will this work with all PKI, non PKI versions? Well, if I if I understand correctly, you were asking about um, what is the charge, uh, what, uh, what's the licensing cost, and that would be a question um, depending on the size of your product, how many flavors of it. Um, I would suggest you contact uh, licensing at wolfssl.com. I I don't have any information on um, on the costs. It it, it, it depends. Um, okay. And so so another question. Uh, uh, part that I heard is I I thought you were you were asking about TLS one point three. Does it work with go government? Like we we work with the government uh, bodies also. So uh, yeah. like we can uh, like work with government departments. If is uh, is it capable to like uh, other SSS? Yes, ab absolutely. So whatever um, whatever protocol you're using. Um, so if you have. Uh, say TLS 1.3 on an espresso device and you want to talk to um, some other, I don't know, you, you mentioned government, if there's some other listener, for instance, um, as long as everybody's complying with all of the RFCs, Wolf SSL will work with anybody, right? It, it's all about the standards. And so if, uh, yeah, as long as the receiving side is following the RFCs, um, Absolutely, Wolf SSL will work. And if it doesn't, well, then let's take a look at um, why not. And and I am 100% certain that if any of the engineers saw a situation where um, we could either help you identify um, the other side of what might be wrong, and if by um, the unlikely chance that something's wrong with Wolf SSL, it would absolutely be fixed. So I yes, absolutely, it will work. Okay. Another any free version is available there? Absolutely free version, something like that. Um, I'm not really sure. Could you clarify? You're asking about three versions. Free, free version. Yes, SSL free version SSL. Oh, so like TLS one point three. TLS one point three is absolutely free. Um, you can use TLS. Oh, uh, um. So are you asking about like TLS 1.2 versus 1.3 or are, are you asking if it's free as an F-R-E-E? -E? Sorry. F-R-E-E. -E. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, if you comply, if you comply with a GPL V2 license, um, you can download Wolf Excel and use it in your project and there, there is no cost. If you want a commercial product and you don't want to comply with the GPL V2 license, then we have a commercial license available. Does, does that answer your question? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So where we can find it out on the website itself? Uh, there's a link over there. Oh yeah, so, the at, so at, uh, if you go to github.com forward slash wolfssl, okay. or you just go to wolfssl.com, so either of those. 
and uh, moreover do you have partners in asia like uh, we we uh, we are wanted to be on board with uh, like uh, partnered in south asia that's that's a good question i believe we do have uh, i know for certain that we have sales directors uh, business directors that um, are responsible for the asia area but do you have a specific business partner in mind that you're wondering whether we partnered with you know we, and we, really that we ourselves are looking for as a uh, you know business partner we we have a good representation here in south asia and uh, so we wanted to be considered as a business partner here in south asia and we have our commercial platform side biz we are working on it like where we uh, sell product like uh, crm erps and all so where we can like uh, standard product we can sell uh, a particular or of your sss on my platform where we have uh, onboarding uh, smbs like uh, small medium business groups and msme like in india there is micro small and medium enterprises so we are empaneled with government of india here in for uh, msmes so we can sell product uh, for uh, website uh, consists of msmes right so we we have a good exposure here in south asia so we can represent uh, your product uh, in our portal Oh, that you know that that sounds that sounds wonderful. Um, it, it's really out of my wheelhouse, though. Um, I'm a I'm an engineer. I'm a consultant. Um, and you you I, connect me to like salespersons, like yeah, who can absolutely. Uh, you know, like one of one of our moderators that's here um, might be able to help you. And and for anybody else, um, if you have a question like that beyond an engineering question, um, sure, fax sure. f a c t s <laughs> at Wolf S S L. And so do we do we have one of the business directors on yeah. there? Hey Jim, this is Kristen. I'll jump in. I'm one of the moderators here. We'll be happy to share and connect you with um, the appropriate contact that can that can get you all the answers um, following the, the webinar. My pleasure. My out. pleasure. Okay, so go ahead, Jim. Why don't we continue on? All right. Super. Uh, other than uh, like my engineers will be uh, like any of the question they need will put up uh, later on. Uh, meanwhile, I'm done here. Thank you. All right. Thank, Thank you. you so much for your question. So do we have other questions? Yes, there's another person raising a hand, so I will unmute the person. Sorry, uh, all those clicks throughs that I had to do. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you fine. Thank you. Okay. So uh, the, following up on this question about acceleration, we're in different environments. Uh, do you have, uh, I mean, I assume you use uh, acceleration uh, available in the instruction set when it's available, right? So. Uh, can you speak briefly to like what uh, I don't even know what's available in Extensa and on Risk Five, the, the it's also kind of a little fuzzy. There are like different instruction sets extensions relevant to what Wolf SSL is doing. Can you speak right. to it? Like what accelerations are used? Oh, yes, absolutely. Are selected? Yes, absolutely. And so, yeah, I, I realize the the topic of acceleration. We could have an entire webinar on on the acceleration topic. Um, the acceleration on the ESP thirty two chips it's it's not an instruction as like for instance on an Intel platform where you have special CPU instructions that do things faster. In the, in the case of Espressive, um, there are there are registers, right? So like, say you're gonna compute a SHA hash. And so what you do is you, instead of doing that in software, you, you take the data that you wanna compute and you put it in a piece of memory and, and essentially you just push a little button, a register, right? You toggle a little bit and the hardware will then compute the answer. Um, there are a variety of, of hardware acceleration things specific to um, so the embedded cryptography, for instance, there's there's an RSA accelerator that I, I've been working on recently. That um, there's math acceleration, right? And so, say you have you know a big part of cryptography is you have you have two different numbers and you want to perform some operation on them, like say multiplication, right? But they're really big numbers, 
And so the hardware acceleration, you take each of those big numbers, you, you put them in, in memory, you know, you just feed all of the bytes into a chunk of memory, like you, like the X operand and someplace else you put the Y operand. And, and then again, you, you, you toggle a button, you push a button and it goes and it computes the, the answer, right? And so there's like, for instance, um, X to the Y mod M, you, you give it those different parameters, you push the button, you wait a short amount of time. And in, instead of, you know, a relatively computationally intensive process in software, right? The, the hardware just does that. Um, so I, I do have um, all the hardware acceleration working on the ESP32, the classic, the extensive architecture. I'm currently working on, not yet complete, to have the Risk Five. It's a, it works a little bit differently. Um, so I, I don't yet have that um, pushed to the, the main GitHub repository for Wolf SSL, um, but it, it's something similar where you have, you know, not so much instructions themselves, but you have large computa computationally intensive algorithms that you you put into software to to do that. Um, each of them can be turned on and off. We talked about the user settings.h file. So each of those different algorithms um, or, or just hardware acceleration in its entirety can be turned on and off. Um, does, that, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thank you. All right, super. Yeah, anything else? At the moment, I don't have any other questions. Okay, cool. So uh, we're, we're near the end here. And um, so I just wanted to point out uh, some of my last slides here. So on, on Visual GDB, for instance, um, this is a, a static screenshot that I took of, we'll see that it's the Wolf SSL server. And so what I did is I put a breakpoint here. And if you've ever used Visual Studio, you just, you take your cursor, you just click there, you'll get this little red dot. You'll see that there's a yellow arrow on top of that red dot thing that this breakpoint on the ESP32 got hit. And this is where we're creating a new Wolf SSL object. So it's, uh, so you pass it the CTX, the context. This is where you, you set what sort of cipher suites you want. Um, Visual Studio allows you to hover over, I'm hovering over that CTX. And, and in Visual Studio, this, this little hover box pops up. You can click on each of these down, these arrows here to, to drop down more details on the, the variables. And this is reading directly from memory. Okay, so there's so here's an embedded application running on the ESP32, and, and you can reach into memory and see what the values are. Um, you see the breakpoints that I have here. So these two breakpoints are currently disabled. These big circle with, with it's not filled with red. This red circle is where the breakpoint is. Um, how did we get there? So here's the call stack, right? So here's the RTOS wrapper started the main task called app main, and we have this, uh, this server task that's running. And so that's, so we see the call stack right here. On the same screen, we see the, the COM port that's being, um, the, all the data that we, you'd see on your serial port. Um, one of the things that I really like is just to be able to see the whole project. We talked about where the Wolf SSL components are in the components directory. Uh, there's just one custom component in this project and it's called Wolf SSL. Um, the header files, the, your user settings.h is there. Um, you can expand this one, this ESPIDF. There, you can see all the ESPIDF components. Um, you can see the partition table file here. Um, CMake files. Visual Studio allows you to single step debug CMake files. So you can actually put a breakpoint just like this with your C code, and you can single step CMake files. Um, that's not a feature of Visual GDB. I think that's just a standard feature of Visual Studio. Um, so if you've ever used Visual Studio, right, the, if I press the, if I, if this was live, I, I could press the continue button, it starts running, stop, stops execution. This button is reflash and restart. This button just sends the reset command to restart. Um, this steps into, step over, step out. If you've done single step debugging, um, you know what those are. Um, yeah, we kind of skipped ahead to the exciting um, ESP32 S3. If you um, this uh, the S3 that I used had eight megabytes of PS RAM, and we were able to get uh, not only Linux running, but I was able to cross compile the Wolf SSL benchmark. So if you follow me on Twitter, you'll see that I was able to get 
Wolf, the WolfSL benchmark app that we saw running um, on the ESP32, but I compiled it as a command line app and included it with the Linux kernel being installed on the ESP32. And I was able to run the WolfSL benchmark. And, and the amazing thing is, right, to have Linux installed, it, it was like performance on the ESP32 S3 in a Linux environment, the benchmark performance was on par with that in free RTOS running. Now, I'm not recommending that, you know, there's a lot of complexity that comes with Linux. So this is a, this is a subset of Linux. It's much more complex with more moving parts, um, more potential points of failure. But if you wanted, if you had an application use case where uh, Linux on an ESP32 using Wolf SSL would be appropriate. Uh, I, I did show a proof of concept that is possible. And so here we, you know, this is the end of my slide. I appreciate everybody hanging out. I see we're well over time. So I appreciate you guys all hanging out to, to see it through. Uh, we talked about what is Wolf SSL. Um, so what did we learn today? Um, Wolf SSL is a suite of cryptography libraries and applications. Um, we talked about how you can try Wolf SSL. You can download it from GitHub. You can go to wolfsl.com for a specific release uh, zip file. We talked about the dual license nature, so that if your project complies with GPL v2, or you can have something that's proprietary and private um, with a commercial option, um, you can have GPL version 2 and sign up for engineering services and 7x24 support. They're, they're not mutually exclusive, where we can certainly help you with your project. Um, how can you learn more? WolfSSL.com, of course. Um, any question that you have, uh, you can send them an email at fax, F-A-C-T-S, at WolfSSL.com. So this was my slide to ask questions, but I, I can certainly, uh, we can certainly pause um, if there are more questions. Um, oh, this was kind of the most important thing for all the people that decided to hang out. Uh, I worked out a deal that if... Uh, if you watch the webinar today and you can get Wolf SSL working on your project and you share that on social media, we can send you some cool Wolf SSL swag. So it's always nice to see what other people are doing. It, it works all around, right? We see what other people are doing. We uh, make sure that our software works with your project and the more people that are having different projects, the better. And so I, I'd like to see what you're gonna do with uh, Wolf SSL on the SP32. So further information, wolfssl.com forward slash docs, specifically for the embedded developers, there's a best practices link. Um, practices to keep in mind, um, and you probably guess what some of those issues are, right? We talked about limited memory. Um, you, you don't have the performance that you do with a, a desktop with a you know an Intel processor. Um, let's see. So how to get WolfSSL, you can download WolfSSL from our website. Uh, there's a download button on the main bar. GitHub, github.com forward slash WolfSSL. Um, more on documentation, um, right? We're on the web, wolfssl.com. There's a blog. There's a lot of blogs that get put out. There's our engineers are continually posting all of the latest cool stuff that's going on at WolfSSL. The docs, yeah, I know it kind of takes away all the fun if you have to read the documentation, but there is a lot of really good documentation available. Uh, the repository again at Wolf SSL. Um, there's a there's an other examples. Uh, so there's a the core Wolf SSL library is here, um, but we we try to keep it clean um, with just the core examples. But over in Wolf SSL dash examples, there are even more examples, and there's also a a uh, similar Wolf SSH and a Wolf SSH example. So be sure to check out all the other repositories for all the, all the interesting things going on there. Um, the forums, if you have a question um, you think would benefit others by asking it publicly, we have a forum. If you want to ask me a private question, you can send me a message on Twitter. Uh, you can send me an email, Jim at Wolf SSL, if you want to send something to um, so general support, um, support at Wolf SSL. And that that's it. Um, that was my presentation for today. I see there's still a bunch of people connected. Um, are there any other questions?
Jay is a person raising a hand, so I can unmute and the person can okay. ask a question. Great. Hey, me again. So uh, the Linux on ES, uh, ESP, uh, I, I, there was like some really weird thing where the guy emulated Risk Five and then ran Risk Five kernel uh, a couple of years ago. But like, the, can you say which what were you exactly running? Which version? Which kernel? Oh yeah, you know I have. Um, I have an entire thread on Twitter that goes through all of the steps. I can tell you that it is not an emulation. Um, there is a guy, I, sorry, I don't remember what his Twitter handle is, but if you go out to the Go Jimmy Pie and look through my history, there's there's really one guy that takes credit for getting um, the Extensa Rudy Mansions. Rudy mentions him a lot. Yeah. So Rudy, um, he super kind of, he kind of pushed me and I, I, it was something I always wanted to learn. So we, we did that over a weekend. So he leveraged the work of um, this other guy and helped me compile my own Linux kernel and put it on the ESP32. It, it was actually pretty amazing. I, to tell you the truth, I had never actually ever compiled my own Linux kernel. Yeah, I know I've lived under a rock. Um, but it's not emulated. It was it was genuinely from source. It takes a little while. It took a long while to compile. Um, and yeah, it's it's not emulated. It was on the Extensa architecture, um, specifically the ESP32 S3. And there's there's a bunch of flavors of the S3, um, and they're designated with a dash N and then Nancy followed by a number. And um, so the amount of PS RAM, and so the smallest you need at least eight megabytes of PS PS RAM to get Linux working. So I see the uh, printouts, and it looks like the kernel version six three, right? Is that is that consistent with what you did? Oh, you know, it was uh, wow. It was actually a couple of months ago, and, and honestly, I I don't have it handy, and I I don't remember the exact version but if you found the screen snips it uh, i assume it it is what it says i'm sorry i, I don't remember the specific version though all right thank you <laughs> i learned something very interesting today oh yeah uh, no it was, in addition it was, to everything else <laughs> yeah no it was it was quite a learning experience for me too and so i i don't know if rudy's on the line today, but I, I want to extend um, a thanks. I, it's uh, it, it's a pretty amazing piece of work, and I really appreciate all the help that he provided to me to get it to work. So it, I, I mean, it was just a learning curve for me. He, he would tell me things, right? I had never built my own Linux kernel before, and so it, but it was pretty exciting. I, I was, uh, was really quite happy to actually eventually get that working, and then to get Wolf SSL compiled and included on the binary that gets written and to be able to log in to Linux on an ASP32 and, and run the Wolf SSL benchmark. Yeah, that was that was just excellent. Anything else? Can I, I mean, while we have the time? Yeah, I don't have any question at the moment. And so I will try to wrap it up if it's okay. That works for me. Yeah, I realize um, we ended up running way long, um, but thank you everybody for showing up. This was my first ever webinar as well. So I was able to give some good information and inspire you to use Wolf SSL on your next project. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for attending the webinar today. And thank you, Jim, to host such an informative webinar. Please don't forget to follow us on Twitter at the Wolf SSL and other social. And also please go follow Jim at a tw on Twitter, how to go Jimmy Pie and thank you for attending and see you next week. Bye. Bye.